September 1st, 2021 meeting of the State Board of Education. Roll call, please. Ms. DeLosa. Present. Mr. Durham. Present. Dr. Ernest. Present. Dr. Frazier. Present. Thank you. Mr. Gassina. Present. Mr. Mapes. Here. Ms. Moe. Ms. Moe. Here. Thank you. Ms. Rensselaer. Here. Mr. Watts. Here. Dr. Jack. Here. Thank you. We have four. Thank you. Let's please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Motion, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the August 11th, 2021 meeting? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Motion carries. So um, quick statement from me. Welcome to the September meeting. It was nice that it actually kind of feels like September out there. The the little brisk temperature, um, the, the wind was, was blowing, but it was uh, certainly good to welcome September in. Um, I often feel like September is when, when schools, when I as a teacher and school administrator started to get into the routine and get things going. I, I know for our schools this year with COVID-19 still around, it, it is still provided or caused um, challenges within our schools. So we, again, as we always do, want to thank our educators um, very sincerely for all you're doing to keep our students in Indiana in person and safely learning as this pandemic uh, continues. I also want to note that um, as our schools work hard to keep students learning safely in person, we are in communication with the General Assembly in an effort to bring attention to concerns raised by school leaders regarding some potential un unintended financial penalties that may result from quarantine or COVID that would only be caused based on the 85% um, attendance law. And I could go into the weeds on that. I'm not going to in this setting, but if you have follow-up questions on that, we're certainly glad to answer, um, but our team is, is working closely again with the House and the Senate, um, hopeful for uh, a resolution soon. Um, I also want to take a moment, I don't know that we've talked about this at a board meeting yet, I know we've started to put some releases out about uh, Indiana's partnership with the college, college football playoff foundation in preparation for the college football playoff, which will occur Monday, January 10th, 2022. Um, normally, I would not probably talk about a, a football game in a board meeting, um, but I wanna tell you why I mention it, because their whole philanthropy and, and focus is on educators, celebrating educators, um, elevating the educator profession, which is of course right along uh, right, right in step with, with where we are as a board, as a department, as a state. And so we're coming <coughs> along as partners with them. There are going to be a variety of events hosted to celebrate teachers, elevate the profession over the next several months. Um, I'm going to mention a couple just today, and we'll again continue to keep you posted. Um, but this is also not just events. It's also... Uh, and, and Pat, I think you're on this subcommittee, I think BJ is as well, uh, the e-learning the e lab, which was started by several philanthropies right here in Marion County in partnership with schools and others, uh, that is going to be scaled uh, in a bigger way to the whole state to have access um, and to, to have just more available for teachers. It's going to be the, the Indiana Learning Lab. 
Um, we're investing um, as a department, as a state, uh, in this to make it sustainable for all teachers throughout Indiana. But that's one example of a prom takeaway um, of, of the partnership. But a couple other events that I do want to mention. The Extra Yard for Teachers Week is September 10th through 18th. And that is uh, on, on September 12th specifically, and you may have seen the announcement this week, Department of Natural Resources has partnered with us as well. They're opening all their state parks free to teachers and families. Um, we would, I'll be out there. I know Pat will be out there. Uh, why don't you, Pat? <laughs> I'm, putting him on. I'm making sure he's listening. <laughs> Greg, Erica, William, uh, Byron. Uh, but the big thing is teachers and families, um, educators and families to relax, to enjoy a day outside. Um, and again, it's uh, in about five of the state parks or, la or lakes, there will be food, music, activities. So more to come on that. We, we've started pushing some information out, but again, we're just really pleased to partner. Um, the other thing that's happening is, I think um, Indiana is the first, or Indianapolis as the host city is the first city to say, let's not just celebrate Indianapolis educators, let's celebrate all Indiana, the whole, let's do the whole state. And so another thing that is happening is every Friday night, there are two football games somewhere in the state, different locations all over the state, where there's a tailgate, um, and, and the whole focus again is again, elevating educators and celebrating um, the work that is happening in our classrooms and schools. So we'll certainly continue to share information out, but I wanted to, to recognize that partnership, and we sincerely hope to see many teachers out on September 12th at our state parks. On that note, um, any other board member comments and reports? Public comment, we have two. Are we going to, we have an election of a secretary. You know what, did I skip over that, Pat? Yeah. I sure did. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So <laughs> let's, how about we elect a secretary? So. Um, just to, to, to back up a little, let me, let me level set why. Uh, Pete Miller, who had served on our board for a few years, was recently hired to be DUAB state agency head, so he's now the DUAB executive director. And so he had to leave our board, of which we will be replacing that member, but Pete also served as our secretary. And so we do need to elect a secretary, and I will take motions at this time, or nominations. I would like to nominate Mr. Durham to be our secretary of the board. Second. We have, I'm looking at him, making eye contact to see. We have a motion and a second for William Durham to be State Board of Ed secretary. Um, Chad, do we need to take any other nominations, or is this just a vote? And, Okay. Um, all in favor for William Durham to be secretary, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? Mr. Durham, you are our new secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to make sure I don't skip anything else now. <laughs> Back over here. You got to thinking about football, and it just got you so oh, excited. Oh, that that's, that's, that's what it was. I actually am very excited about the discussion today right here, the Indiana graduate prepared to succeed in our performance dashboard ahead. But, but yes, the, the, short, the short comments about football were good, too. OK, so we do have a couple of public comments. Let's start with Adam Jones from Skybound Education. Good morning. Good morning. Honorable State Board of Education members, my name is Adam Jones, and I'm the founder of Skybound Education. In late April, my organization was selected by the IDOE to lead a strategic planning consortium 
of schools as part of the state's efforts to help students recover from the pandemic and maximize the impact of these federal COVID relief dollars. So during my comments today, I'd like to highlight the schools I have the privilege of serving, provide an overview of the work we've done so far, and a preview of what we hope to achieve in the days ahead. So I'm pleased to share that Skybound will be supporting six school districts through the 2022-2023 school year, which allows me to be part of the state's multi-year approach to tackling the significant widespread academic impacts that this board has already discussed. So who, who's in the consortium? Uh, I'm pleased to say that Culver Community Schools, led by Karen Schumann, North Central Park Community Schools, led by Mike Schimpf, South Central Community Schools, led by Dr. Theodore Stevens, South Spencer County Schools, led by Dr. Richard Rutherford, Southwestern Jefferson County Consolidated Schools, led by Jeff Bates, and Yorktown Community Schools, led by Dr. Gregory Henshaw and Dr. David Sturgeon. And if you're keeping count, that's three of the six have South in the name. Um, so, so what have we done so far? In June, I met with these school leaders, and, and in some, t some cases, school leader teams, from each of these districts to learn more about how their communities were specifically impacted by COVID in terms of both academics, staff morale, uh, facilities, improvements that were needed, and to develop initial, an initial understanding of their goals moving forward and their funding priorities for these federal dollars. And I also wanted to share in June how Skybound might support them and how participating in this consortium with five other school districts could prove beneficial and add some efficiencies moving forward. Then in July and early August, I met with five of the six districts again, and I highlighted the academic impact study that was presented to this board on July 14th. I incorporated that information with each district's averages on iLearn and iSTEP compared to state averages. And that really illuminated the need even further to accelerate learning, that there's great work to be done and to improve the social and emotional well-being of staff and students over the next several months. And these conversations over the summer led to a refined shared list of priorities for each district team. Well, I'm really pleased to say that just a couple weeks ago on August 18th, we came together for the first time as a consortium. And 20 people participated in person and four participated virtually. And I have to say as a side note, that gave me a preview of what teachers have been going through, having participants in class, participants on the computer, and it's not easy. So tremendous respect to our educators. And during that meeting on the 18th, we tackled several things. We sought to develop an initial culture of collaboration that would be sustained over these school years. And I wanted to make a particular case that this is the time for risk taking and innovation. And I wanna share a brief summary of what I shared with the group. The academic impact data at the state level and the national level are disheartening. And national studies of the pandemic's impacts on students' mental health are equally distressing but we're all fighting the same fight, and we should be energized by the fact that we're not alone. So this is the time to take risk. We have more financial resources than perhaps ever before, and this is the time to try new things. And we must also accept that not everything we try is going to succeed, or at least at the level we hope it will. But with strategic planning and collaboration, especially across districts, we have a wonderful opportunity to help students recover from the pandemic and thrive. So we took those funding priorities that were discussed in the summer and we crafted very specific SMART goals. And that process is still underway. And, and the reality is many of these districts have a lot of goals they wanna tackle with these federal dollars. And while that's great, my goal as a facilitator of the consortium was to help them narrow the focus to find some areas where there were natural opportunities to collaborate between them. And then once that was done, we started using a common template to draft project plans with things like ongoing tasks or habitual behaviors that would lead to positive results, and also time-bound tasks, things that needed to be completed by a specific date to make sure we were on task. So that concluded our first consortium-wide meeting on August 18th, 
and participants overwhelmingly reported anonymously that it was a solid foundation for ongoing strategic planning. Our goal is to meet again before the end of this calendar year, and of course we'll have future meetings uh, in the coming months. So at this point I want to share just a bit more about Skybound's vision for supporting schools and how a software tool called Asana will feature into our work moving forward. So Skybound's theory of action is this. School leaders have great ideas based on the unique knowledge of their students, staff, and families. And while Skybound has a role in asking questions that help district leaders refine their thinking, the initiatives they've envisioned for their communities are responsive to local needs. So what school leaders often truly need is capacity and warm accountability. Someone to help chart out projects, curate and create resources as needed, and facilitate regular check-ins with stakeholders to ensure progress is being made. So that's where we are today. Each district is working on their project plans using a common template, and then these completed templates will be entered into Asana. This is an online task management and progress monitoring software that will make these projects dynamic rather than static. So we don't want papers and binders living on a shelf for planning. With Asana, school leaders will be able to pull up a dashboard from any device at any time and see which tasks have been completed, which are in progress, which ones are coming up, and which ones are overdue. Skybound will have access to this information too, and in this way we can support each other, directing capacity and support where it's needed most. Also, Asana includes a space for consortium members to communicate with each other, including by posting questions and resources. We're in the early stages of using the tool in this way, but the possibilities are promising. So I just want to close with two thoughts. First, consortium members are very grateful to be part of this strategic planning process. They don't often get this time in the whirlwind of their work. And second, I'm grateful for the honor to serve these schools. And as a former high school teacher and educa educator and a parent of two young children, I know how important this time is. So to play a part in the state's efforts to accelerate learning is truly a privilege. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate your Tom and, and your work to support our schools in accelerated learning. And Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Baker. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for allowing me the chance to speak with you this morning. My name is Steve Baker. I've been an educator and been an educator for 37 years and uh, starting my 23rd year as principal of Bluffton High School. I also serve on the executive committee for Indiana Association of School Principals. What I want to talk today with you about is the performance dashboard. Uh, but before I do that, I want to be very intentional to thank Dr. Jenner and Ron Sandlin, Jason Callahan, Brian Murphy. Uh, for allowing us to have a seat at the table, not just us as an IESP, but all educators. Um, please don't underestimate that gratitude and that appreciation. Uh, we're very grateful for that voice, for having that seat. We respect the process, we respect the leadership, and we are very thankful that we are part of that discussion. So thank you to everyone who has made us a part of that. I do want to focus my comments on the performance dashboard today, and they will be brief. Having the opportunity to participate in discussion with other principals all over the state on the concept of a performance dashboard for school accountability, those principals and I support this idea to provide greater transparency for what our school can do for our kids, but more importantly, represent what our kids can do for our community and for our state. Looking at accountability through the lens of what skills our students should have upon graduation signifies what the students should know when they leave K through 12 education, and it's an investment into future opportunities, not just earning a diploma. Creating ways that schools and corporations can represent all the good things that they do beyond the current data points further connects the school to the community. A performance dashboard also opens the doors for schools to showcase the strengths of their students and community. As Dr. Jenner has said, a carrot is always more effective than a stick. So I just want to give you an example of what we would be talking about for Bluffton High School. Just give you a little bit about Bluffton High School, where 475 students are free and reduced rates, about 50% uh, for the district, we're a rural school, rural community. These are the things we want to highlight through our dashboard. 
Our graduation rate for over the last seven years is 98%. The reason it's not 100% is because of our intense intervention, unfortunately, that they do not count toward a diploma, even though I think they should. Uh, but it's 98%. We've had one dropout in the last 15 years. And no, we don't play the homeschool game. We are under 5% for every cohort. Uh, and our graduation rate is that strong. We are now graduating 50% of our students with an academic honors or technical honors diploma. 0% of our students had general diplomas last year, 0%. We also had 0% graduation ravers last year in the class of 2021. Freshmen earning credits, every freshman at Bluff Night School earned at least 13 credits last year during their freshman year. So they are on pace to graduate. We offer welding, as several of you know, and Dr. Ernst and I have talked about that at length. Uh, we have a certification passing rate with the AWS of 85%, and earning that credential gives them another ticket to their future. And we do offer 21 dual credit courses with 70% of our students earning dual credit. Those are the things we want to be held accountable for on the performance dashboard. That's what our community wants to know. Notice I didn't say what our I-STEP score is on there. No offense, but our community doesn't really want to know that. We were above the state average again this year, and we hit our five-year average even with our pandemic and our scores last year, but that's not what our community wants to know. Indiana has the opportunity to lead this type of thinking whereby our accountability system represents the tremendous work our educators do each and every day, especially right now. We look forward to being involved in those discussions with DOE and State Board, and we want to help in whatever way that we can. So thank you for, again, allowing us that opportunity and, and being a part of the discussion of the performance dashboard. I'm, I'm excited where this will go, and um, we just want, want to be part of that exciting process. So thank you. Thank you, Steve, for your, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you for your comments, and thank you for you and others who have already started supporting and helping with the work ahead. Thank you. More to come. Appreciate sure. that. Okay, that is our final public comment for today. Let's move on then. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. With a motion and a second, any discussion? Roll call, please. Ms. DeLosa. Yes. Mr. Durham. Yes. Dr. Ernest. Aye. Dr. Freitas. Yes. Mr. Gastineau. Yes. Mr. Mapes. Yes. Ms. Moat. Yes. Ms. Rentschler. Yes. Mr. Watts. Yes. And Dr. Jenner. Yes. Thank you. New business today. We have two items. The first one is HEA 1003 waiver for North Harrison. So we have one waiver in front of the board today. This is from North Harrison Community School Corporation. The school corporation is requesting a waiver from IC 203023, which is the 180 instructional day requirement. Like many of the school corporations we heard at the last meeting, they have asked to count the school year in instructional minutes or instructional hours as opposed to instructional days. Like every single school corporation that's been approved for this waiver so far, North Harrison school days are already longer than they would need to be to count for a full instructional day, so they're simply asking to, to count a little bit differently, and they will still be providing the uh, minimum amount of instructional time required for their students. So with that, the staff recommendation is to uh, approve that waiver request. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. With a motion and a second, any discussion? Chad, roll call, please. Ms. DeLosa. Yes. Mr. Durham. Yes. Dr. Ernest. Aye. Dr. Freitas. Yes. Mr. Gastineau. Yes. Mr. Mapes. Yes. Ms. Moat. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Rentschler. Yes. Mr. Watts. Yes. And Dr. Jenner. Yes. Thank you. I'll inform the school. And Chad, you might stay up there. We have a resolution honoring Pete Miller, our board member who has taken another position and is yeah. not on, on the board anymore. So I'm happy to read this and list. That would be excellent, sure. thank you. So as, whereas Mr. Pete Miller has served with distinction as a member of the Indiana State Board of Education representing the 4th Congressional District, 
whereas Mr. Miller has dedicated himself to public service as a former member of the Indiana Senate, whereas Mr. Miller was most recently appointed by Governor Eric J. Holcomb in 2019 to serve on the board, whereas Mr. Miller was then appointed by the Board of Secretary, whereas Mr. Miller ensured the needs of the 4th Congressional District schools were brought to the attention of the board, whereas Mr. Miller has been a tireless advocate for students not just in the 4th Congressional District but around the state, and whereas Mr. Miller is well respected by his fellow board members and colleagues in the education community for his dedication to improving educational outcomes for all students across Indiana, now, th now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Indiana State Board of Education wish to express their deepest appreciation to Mr. Miller for his exemplary service to the board, to recognize him for his contributions as a board member, to acknowledge his distinguished leadership on the board, and to thank him for his dedication to Indiana schools, but most importantly, his dedication to Indiana students. Is there a motion to approve the resolution honoring Pete Miller? Move to approve this resolution. Second. second. With a motion and a second, any discussion? Can I, can I just really quick. Absolutely. I, I consider Pete a good friend. We got to know each other when he was on the state Senate and we realized very quickly that we think a lot of the, the same things about doing the right things for, uh, for kids. And that's an easy thing to say, but a harder thing to do. And, and I always saw that out of him that he was doing the things that were right. Um, for students and always appreciated that about him. So um, big, big loss for our board, um, great hire for the state, right? And so um, I just want Pete to know how much um, we and, and I personally thought of him. COVID, COVID, we didn't get to do coffee like we used to all the time or lunch, but, uh, um, but I just appreciated Pete being on the board, his way of looking at things and, and asking the right questions and always came at it from a, an attitude of inquiry. So, so Pete, you're appreciated if you're listening to this. I, I hope you're not, but if you're listening to this, um, um, you're appreciated. Thank you. We'll make sure he has the sound bite right there. Yeah, there you go. But, it, but any other comments or discussion about Pete Miller? I feel like he's not here. We could we could roast, roast to yeah. a roast to as well. Oh, well, I could give you some things. No, but yeah, well, but in in Byron, you you said it well. I mean, Pete was absolutely a thought leader on our board. He he pushed us to a lot to think differently. Um, he will be missed, but he is still serving the state of Indiana, um, and we will absolutely still cross paths with him and and wish him the best. So I think we have a motion and a second, and so uh, can we do a, a yeah, voice vote? You can take a voice, yeah. All you right, know. all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right, motion carries. Perfect, thank you. That's the uh, end of the agenda. Yes, so the so last thing that we have on the agenda is to discuss the, the profile of an Indiana graduate, and I'm gonna ask Ron Sandlin who is Senior Director of School Performance and Transformation, as well as Jason Callahan, who's Assistant Secretary of Pathways and Opportunities to come on up. And while they're coming up, a couple of things. While, while there is a statute that was just passed, 1514, that requires us to, to move on this, we see this as a huge opportunity for our state, and it absolutely aligns with our strategies ahead, which two of which are to re-envision how educational progress is measured and tailored to Indiana students, and then also to strengthen our systems to provide improved information regarding our K-12 programs and results. So we feel like the timing is absolutely right for this discussion. And again, look forward to the more um, substantive conversation today. So take it away, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jenner. And thank you to the State Board for allowing us this opportunity to present on the Indiana graduates to, pre uh, to prepare to succeed in performance dashboard. Just again, introduction, Ron Sandlin is the Senior Director of School Performance and Transformation. And then we also have our Director of Accountability, Maggie Pano, who has done a lot, lot of work on this 
early on. And so I just wanted to recognize both them. Today, I'm going to level set a little bit um, what Dr. Jenner uh, discussed and, and Mr. Baker discussed a, a few minutes ago, and then create a little bit of, of the visioning behind where I think we're moving. And then Ron's gonna come up and talk about the details and kind of the heart of the work where we're at currently. So um, then we'll talk a little bit about timeline and then field some questions. I'd like to begin, uh, prior to coming to the department in January, I was the superintendent of Wabash City Schools in Wabash County. I served there for about 15 years as a high school principal like Mr. Baker and, and then later as a superintendent. The current accountability system uh, helped us to get better. Uh, it drove us to really focus on all students and, and to really focus on ensuring that students were, were graduating from Wabash High School. And we did. We, we built our systems around that accountability system. We, we, we built out an alternative school, credit recovery, comprehensive counseling model where, where our guidance department met with every student to develop a plan. And, and we were successful. Again, as, as Mr. Baker said, uh, Wabash High School moved prior to the four-year cohort. We were about a 60% graduation rate, and we moved that to 90%. And then annually, we were meeting that 90%. And, and again, that accountability system, that metric, that, that push, uh, helped us to get better and better serve our students and our community. But what we found was there was what we called will. These students that, that were graduating from Wabash High School, they were reporting to their guidance counselors before they left that they had plans, post-secondary plans, that about 80% of those students were going to matriculate to some type of two or four year school after graduating from Wabash High School and their diploma type would indicate that they were ready. Um, but what we found after looking at uh, clearinghouse data was that that 80% was really more like 60% that were actually arriving on some campus uh, later that fall. And then from there, from that 60% of that class, then what we recognized was even six years later, only about a quarter to a third of those students were actually earning some type of credential. And so, in spite of the accountability system that we felt like we were doing really well for those students, we felt like the system was, was underserving those students and ultimately our communities. Again, it worked. We kept more students enrolled. We got more students across that stage. But again, they were not matriculating. They were not um, leading to pathways to prosperity. So as we talk about the Indiana Graduate Prepared to Succeed framework, I want you to imagine a day, and I was gonna, so that's the Wabash story. This is also the Indiana story. This is commission for higher ed um, data, uh, and it would, it would track the same as what we found in Wabash. Again, students are saying that they have a plan, but after six years, uh, many are falling through the pipeline. So I want the state board, I want our state to imagine a day when young families can bring their kindergarten child uh, to school with a clear vision of how the K-12 system begins with foundational knowledge connected with the development of the whole child, leading to credentials that carry currency beyond that K-12 experience. Imagine a day that teachers can clearly understand and share in this purpose, can be proud of what they do and see how it connects with the development of the whole child, that they understand their role and the impacts uh, of their work throughout that K-12 development. And imagine a day when schools and communities, higher ed and community partners are activated to innovate and collaborate with a shared North Star to develop pathways that lead to prosperity credentials with currency. Today is the first day of that journey. So as we are beginning to build out these frameworks and think about this dashboard, we wanna begin with the end of mind. 
again, back to those, those data points that I shared and what we learned in Wabash and what we, we've learned across the state of Indiana, we want to ensure that what we're doing leads to credentials with currency beyond the K-12 system. Pathways to prosperity. So begin with the end in mind. We want to address the whole child. Steve alluded to that earlier when he talked about ISTEP and that his community it just did not resonate. Wanted to see that whole child beyond standardized test scores and, and again, those credentials, but the whole child. So in addition to knowledge and content, we also talk about the development of skills and dispositions. And then in, for everybody, all stakeholders in the process to be able to see that it, we're not basing this on one single data point, that we're looking holistically. We talk about this development um, and we talk a lot about not only those credentials, but experiences, work-based, quality work-based learning experiences and the development of those throughout the system. But again, early on, allowing students to explore broadly and that exploration continue to matriculate into the middle grades and then eventually into high school where they can literally experience, again, those pathways to prosperity, real experiences, to ensure that we're doing this for all students, that we're addressing opportunity gaps that lead to achievement gaps for racially and ethnically diverse students and low income and rural students across the state of Indiana. And then as we've again clearly articulated, what gets measured is what gets done. We're emblematic, Bluffton High School, we're emblematic of all our colleagues across the state. We've responded to that accountability system and largely have achieved under that current system. We just have to increase that vision now and move from a system of compliance to a system that is aspirational. And in doing so, we can truly blur those lines as we are providing multiple pathways to prosperity whether students are, have plans to enroll in post-secondary or go directly into the workforce and enlist in the military, we have this seamless system, K-12 experience, that ends in that pathway to prosperity. That everybody's involved. Again, everybody feels engaged. Specifically, our students, that they can see this and have agency, have autonomy, to see that the education system is a vehicle to life fulfillment. And at this point, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Sandlin, and he's gonna talk a little bit about uh, the law and also the details of, uh, again, the framework and the, the dashboard, and then we'll field some questions. Thanks, Jason. And as you all know, the work is only as effective as you can operationalize it, as you can make it tangible and concrete for the folks across the state of Indiana to buy into and implement. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we're gonna take the aspirational vision Mr. Callahan just shared and turn it into reality for our educators, our communities, and most importantly, our children. So as Dr. Jenner mentioned at the start, House Enrolled Act 1514 has really presented us an opportunity. Um, and as many of you know, but I'll share for the folks listening, the law requires for the first time the State Board of Education, based on a recommendation by the Department of Education, to approve a dashboard that includes a compilation of longitudinal performance indicators. Now, the law includes some required indicators, but there's really no limits on how creative, intentional, strategic, and purposeful that we can be in this work to transform the system that Mr. Callahan described into a system that really is in service to an aspirational vision. So it, we are driving student-centered decision-making informed by these meaningful and purposeful indicators of what we want for every single child. So it requires a dashboard. Um, it maintains summative ratings currently, but introduces the concept of an optional indicator level rating, uh, which is something we haven't done in the past as a state. But we're gonna step back a second. B 
Because instead of jumping right into the dashboard, which many people feel the urgency to do with the new law, we want to ground this in purpose. We don't want to fall victim to, to the lessons learned of the past, which are uh, developing systems at the state level that drive decision making in order to achieve an outcome um, that might not always be what's best for individual students. And Dr. Callahan talked a little bit about that, designing a system to get students a high school diploma. Well, in today's 21st century economy, and this has been happening for a while, we all know this, students often need more than a high school diploma to be prepared and successful uh, in their lives. And so we said, before we jump into indicators, let's define that aspirational vision. Let's look back and think to ourselves, what do we want for every single Hoosier graduate in the state of Indiana? And then what does that look like throughout their entire K-12 career? We used Utah's portrait of a graduate as a foundation for this, and the, the, the presentation includes a link to that website, where they've articulated certain characteristics or competencies for their students and then developed a vision across the entire K-12 system for the developmental continuum of those competencies. We wanna reflect that. We wanna, we, wanna, we wanna build that similar profile or that similar portrait for here in the state of Indiana for an Indiana graduate prepared to succeed. The continuum will be learner-centered, student-centered, defining what students need to be able to do aspirationally, uh, not based on a specific uh, metric, but what we believe they need uh, to be successful post-secondary, future-focused, not just living within the K-12 system, but defining this based on what they're gonna need to succeed in life, not just what they're gonna need to be successful while they're in school. And then a holistic approach. And Dr. Jenner and Mr. Callahan both shared the concept of more than one data point. We wanna think about student development, not just around academics, which are incredibly important, but the skills. The skills that we all know we've, we've, we've been successful at and given the opportunity to develop, but right now are not prioritized in our current system. And so in developing our framework for an Indiana graduate prepared to succeed, we will work to articulate a developmental continuum across the entire K-12 pipeline aligned to currently five characteristics. And I, before we jump to the characteristics, the, the big reveal at the end of my presentation are where we're at with those. So hang with me for a couple more slides and we'll talk about those characteristics, but I really wanna ground us in, in the design and the strategy here before we jump uh, to, the, to the specifics. And hopefully our goal is that this continuum will develop a shared vision of the progression for every single student, connecting that third grade teacher and the development that they're working on with their children to the, to the high school experience and why what's happening in third grade is so important. And I give this example. I wanna see a day when a third grade teacher is not so much feeling pressure for a student to pass iRead, mm -hmm. which is a test. I want them to understand that the importance of their role is to ensure that their kids are literate. Because if our students can read, by the time they're finished with their primary years, their formative years, they are set up to achieve in, 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 in really robust ways at the middle school level and take advanced coursework which then frees up their high school schedule to achieve these post-secondary credentials while they're still in the support system of the K-12, of the high school, right? After they walk across that stage, a lot of those supports go away. And so we wanna make sure that they're prepared while, we're, while, while we are there um, to achieve as much as they possibly can. Um, and, and so hopefully, by articulating this progression, this shared vision, uh, we create those connections. And at the end of the day, it's about driving student to centered decision making. We want to make sure that every, so we have a system that establishes the conditions that every single educator can look at a, a student and make the best decision for that kid, and our system captures the outcome. We don't want a system that pigeonholes decision making, right? When, when, a student, when a teacher might believe or an educator might believe that a student needs something, but because our system only measures certain things, we're going to go this direction. And then once we define that aspirational vision, only once we define that aspirational vision that's driving our decision, we will layer the dashboard on top. And this is the connection to 1514. So after we've done that work to develop this shared vision for all of our kids across their entire K-12 uh, uh, careers, we will layer intentionally designed indicators at key benchmarks along the way. I always go back to this example um, and, and, and primary literacy. Currently, we measure student performance on iLearn across all grade levels and give it one score. But we all know research shows us primary literacy is critical to the, to the lifelong success of a child. Nowhere in our system do we elevate third grade literacy in any type of meaningful and intentional way. 
And so we, that's, that's a clear example of a benchmark along this continuum that could serve as an indicator on the dashboard. But again, that indicator is there because it's a critical benchmark along this developmental continuum. And if we design this dashboard in service to the vision, we really think we will center students and empower educators, and then the data will help inform those decisions. And if we do that really well, and this is, this is really important, I wanna say this out loud to the board as we think about this. If we do it really well, we'll be able to capture the current opportunity gaps that exist in our system, mm -hmm. highlight them specifically and intentionally, and then drive resources and supports to the students who need them most. So this visualization, I think it's important that I point out, is not signaling anything other than to illustrate the layering of indicators on top of a continuum. But one thing that is on here is graduate, graduation and beyond. Through this work, we are redefining the terminal endpoint or where our, our K-12 system should expect students to be when they finish. And that is prepared for post-secondary success. And the best way to determine whether or not a student is prepared for post-secondary success is to acknowledge the importance of how well they're doing outside, out, excuse me, how well they're doing after high school. And so we're gonna elevate outcomes-based indicators as an informational tool for our K-12 system, as a way to determine how well we are preparing our students for post-secondary success. And we look forward to working with stakeholders across the state to help us define and cultivate that as a formative informational piece of information, not as an accountability stick piece of information. Because we know there's a lot of dynamics around those data, but it's the best way to measure whether or not they're actually prepared. Are they successful? And, and Ron, pause there. Post-secondary success could mean not just enrollment, but also it, employment, mm -hmm. the Very, skills to, so yes. it, it, there, it, I just wanted to signal it's not college for all, right? It, every student has a unique pathway, quality work-based learning um, matters yep. as well. So I just wanted to clear up that quick definition that it, it's more, it's beyond just one. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. In my head, I think post-secondary and I think after secondary. I, I, yeah, I know, I know but, how but, you think. Yeah, yes. but, but, the, uh, but the general terminology is often used in, in the traditional higher education sense. And no, we firmly believe um, that there are multiple pathways to prosperity and not all of them go through an institution of higher education uh, explicitly, but they all include some level of post-secondary credential. And that can be a career certification, a short-term industry certification that gets you into the door of a high demand, high wage job, and then create, and, and then provide you the skills necessary to continue your education after high school. And so here's the big reveal. Thanks for hanging with me. We are currently working with five characteristics of an Indiana graduate prepared to succeed, which will serve as the bedrock, the foundation of our Indiana GPS continuum. Over the next month, now that these have been presented publicly, the department will be developing different uh, opportunities and strategies to gauge public input um, on each of these characteristics. Um, so they are not final by any means, but I will also say that what you see on the board is informed by broad and diverse stakeholder input for which we are very grateful. Um, and we look forward to expanding that input uh, to the general public so that we can hear from, uh, from, from all, all walks uh, of, of, of our state, educators, community members, employers, higher ed. We wanna make sure that what we're saying from the state level is what our people believe uh, is what's best uh, for our children. And so, I'm not gonna read through each of these, you can see them on the screen. Um, I'm gonna transition into a little bit of a timeline conversation here, um, but more information will be coming out on how, how folks can provide public comment um, on where we are right now with our five characteristics of an Indiana graduate prepared to succeed. So next steps, uh, I already kind of uh, uh, led with the first one which is, uh, from today on, we will be get, gathering and soliciting input on the five characteristics of our continuum. So we're not yet to the dashboard, we're not yet to indicators, and that's very intentional, and it's very strategic. We wanna ground this in a purpose-driven vision, an aspirational vision for children, right? Uh, in October, we hope to bring back those characteristics to the board uh, and, and present what input we received and any changes that we've made from, from, from this point in the process. Following October, we will then transition the work to really digging into how we measure these things. A lot of folks see some of those characteristics, characteristics and say, well, how do you measure that? 
Well, here's the thing. We've been asking that question for decades, and we're ready to get to work. Because unless we put something out there, it's never going to get done. It's not going to be perfect. There's going to be bumps along the road. But I think if we all come together around this shared vision, mm -hmm. we'll find a way to meaningfully measure it. So then uh, throughout the month of October, we'll be working on targeted uh, indicator development. We'll be prepared to discuss at a high level where we are with indicators at the November board meeting. Um, throughout this, we'll be soliciting input from, from stakeholders from, from across the spectrum. And then in December uh, of 2021, we hope to bring to this board a set of longitudinal uh, indicators as required in HEA 1514 for the board's approval, the board's consideration and approval. Um, again, after a thorough development and signaling in November, a uh, final approval in December to then uh, allow us to get to work on trans translating those indicators into a dashboard. So with that, Mr. Callian's here as well. Any questions uh, that you all have about the process, the strategy, um, or next steps? Yes, I do. Number one, um, if we learned anything else during the pandemic, and it's what your data shows about what happens to kids after they leave us, is that when they're not in front of educators each and every day, a lot doesn't get accomplished. And I, I struggle when we start looking at the end outcomes and, and the fact that it's there that at some point in time, K through 12 schools will be responsible for that. Because we've learned when we don't have them in front of us, that responsibility when it relies upon the parent doesn't get done. The other thing is, a lot of kids say they wanna to go to college and the biggest hurdle they have in front of them is cost. And so they leave that dream of going to college, whether it be a community college, whether it be a four-year college, and they drop out because they can't afford it. And all they see is a lot of debt that's there. And so there's a lot of factors in here that I've seen so far that um, I'm, I'm, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Literacy in the early grades, we have to do a better job. Um, I don't think our teachers just look to get our kids past I read three as much as they try to make certain our kids have all those skills continuously in language, arts, and math, and that's what we're focusing on because that's what we lost during the pandemic. Um, what is required from the bill that we have to measure? Yeah, so in the bill, currently it requires us to measure academic performance uh, as measured by student proficiency as well as growth or academic progress. In it, subject areas of language, arts, and math? It, I think it, it refers to the state assessment. So currently the state assessment is ELA and math. Uh, graduation rate, college credits earned while students are in high school. And it also encourages, when possible, state, national, and international comparisons for any indicators that are selected. So that has to be a part of this no matter what, of the dashboard that we create. Under current law, yes. Yeah. And then obviously some of the things, I don't know how you measure grit. I mean, I don't know why we would ha even have grit on there. Um, I, don't, I don't see where that benefits us as far as, I don't know how a teacher teaches grit. Um, you know, we can keep kids on task and you know, it, there are differences is when I'm sitting in class with kids, I can say, where's your assignment? Where's your work? You know, I help them persevere. But then when they're out on their own, if they don't have that, I don't know that it can be taught. It's kind of something inherent and, and some kind of drive from within that they have that they want to succeed. And once again, that's kind of that blurred line that we continually have between what's the role of the educator, what's the role of the parent? And as I look at some of these things, I, I go back to my own district with 72% poverty, a, at least 30% ELL learners, and whatever we set, we have to continue to remind ourselves of who we serve in the state of Indiana. And we don't have new data yet, but I will guarantee you the amount of poverty in this state has gone up since we've gone through the pandemic. And you know, we talk about what we're doing here with language arts and math. We've been in school now six weeks in Perry Township. Every transitional year we've been dealing with, we're dealing with new behaviors that we've not seen before in ages. We're trying to get to the language arts and math, 
But to be honest, we're teaching kids how to do school again. And um, the resources that we need, and I realize there's been a lot of money put into the system. We've hired more uh, behaviorists than ever before in our district to deal with the kids that came back to us who might have been virtual and basically not in school for 18 months. And I know we need to move forward with a dashboard, and I know we need to start measuring things, but let's be careful how much we throw at us right now because, to be honest, um, and I said this earlier, the recovery is at least two years, and now that we've had our kids this long, maybe three. We got a huge challenge in front of us. And so whatever we do as we build this, I, I, and I struggle because not all kids are, we said post-secondary, and I know we, we think what they do later. That's not the job of K-12 to ensure that. Our job is to prepare them for that, and then where they have drive themselves to go to, that's what being an adult's about. And, and for them to figure that out. I think we have to prepare kids for skills. We have to make certain that they do have you know, critical thinking skills. We need to make certain that they have literacy skills and that they can comprehend. Um, that has to be a foundation as we go through. And Katie knows I say this all the time. We have to redo what our graduation requirements are then. And I know that's not something the state board can do. That's legislation. But that has to be part of this conversation because you can't get to these things if we don't say we're going to blow the system up and change what a high school graduate has to take in courses in order to attain a diploma. I know that's a lot. I'm done. <laughs> so, Pat, you know I always appreciate your comments. Um, you know, I think the opportunity ahead you mentioned the longitudinal outcomes, and Jason, you mentioned it with Wabash. Those who have heard me speak before, I've, I've looked at the data when, when I was in Madison, right, and, and what happens to our students after they graduate from us, and you're exactly right. K-12, we, we can't control what happens when they graduate. None of us can. Even the teachers who put their heart and souls in a child and see them graduate and then hit rock bottom when they leave us. Like we can't control that and it's hard to watch. But I think the one thing we can do is transparently look at where are our students when they graduate. We don't have to be graded for it, but, but what does happen? What is the story? Um, you know, to, to your study in Wabash, um, you know, the 13 years we have the students and, and they're ready to go and when they leave us, they're eager and they want to conquer. What, what, what does actually happen? And I think that's some of the question that, that we have the opportunity to ask. Um, we have the opportunity to transparently show. Um, but it, it does not mean in any way, I want to be very, very clear, um, nor should it, that a, that a school should be, should be right, penalized for what happens after. Um, I think that the opportunity we have is to just ask the question in a transparent manner of, of the, the full spectrum. And we've talked about the post high school, but let's also for a minute pause on the on the pre-K-12 space, that early learning space of which um, I've, I've shared the story I think with you all before. Just this year I had a superintendent call and say, my students are coming in kindergarten not knowing the difference between a lowercase m and a number two. They just don't. But yet 20 miles down the road they can count to 100 they know their letters, uppercase and lowercase, and more importantly, they know how to work with other kids in a classroom environment. Um, and, and that's where even in the early learning space, I think we have the opportunity to look beyond what we've looked at in the past, even the early literacy pieces, and consider the, the full picture and, and what that, that might show. And again, right now it is a, an expiration time um, and time for this type of discussion. This is, this is a, a huge paradigm shift in the state of Indiana. Let's be real. It is. 
And so now is the time that this, this discussion um, should happen. Uh, and again, not only with our board, of which today the discussion should continue, but also with the, the, our stakeholders and our external partners. When we traveled around the state of Indiana, um, I mean, academic mastery is, is absolutely key. We, we must, you talked about literacy by third grade and um, you know, mathematical um, knowledge, et cetera. Um, when we traveled around, what we heard on repeat, and I'll just tell you, what we heard on repeat is skills that kids have, skills that kids have, skills that kids have. Um, and uh, I've been asked multiple times publicly, how is K-12 teaching communication skills? How, what about collaboration? What and so our employability skills right now, for example, we have, um, we have 18 um, that, that were developed. What we've been trying to contemplate is, okay, we've talked about skills for a couple decades now at least. It's not going to be easy, but if this is really important, if communication skills are really important for our students to have more than just how to text message or TikTok, but actually look people in the eyes when they're speaking, stand and, and address a, a, a crowd, which is scary for many kids. If, if we want our kids to have those skills, then I think we as a board have an opportunity to think about how might we measure that and how might we also consider that every single grade level matters for a child. You can't start at ninth grade, and I'm looking back at Mr. Baker because he spoke today, you can't start in ninth grade and expect, you know, expect a kid to be ready to go with experiential learning at the high school level, of which I think we all have an interest in. That foundation has to be built in elementary and middle school and yet right now, we're measuring academic mastery, and that's it. And so all, what we're saying um, for us, what we would love for us as a team to consider in this room and beyond is how might we look beyond just a test score and what else we might measure and not do it in a random act of indicator way where we're just throwing indicators on a board but a really intentional way, thinking about where do we need Hoosier students to be, to, for them to, regardless of their path, to be best set up, and then ha what skills and knowledge do they need prior to that? And again, today is just a kickoff to the conversation, um, and I, I welcome other board members to chime in on this. Can I? So, <laughs> Pat and I have had lots of of bantering about this, right? And and I think, so a couple of comments and then a, a question, um, Ron, for you. W when I hear the graduating but not matricul ma matriculating, matriculating, hard, easy for me to say, right? Um, that gives me pause, right? So, so what are we doing? And th this is a place where I don't think we disagree, Pat. We just disagree how do we get to that point, right? Some of that has to be our responsibility, that, that they're not. To, to whatever we call matriculating, right? That could be to a institution. That could be to, a, to wherever, right? What I don't want them to do is go to the wrong institution that we know a lot of our students go to, right? So, so I think we need to think about that that 10% or whatever it is that goes there. So, so I think this is an important piece that we do have some responsibility beyond. Where, where I get, where I get interested is, in Katie, where your comments went were more to an applied state. So why, I'm not sure that I want ever to say, to be able to, hey, this is, this is our curriculum for communication, right? Why are we not doing, and this is a place where I'm gonna, I've been saying this personally to people, but I'm gonna say it publicly now because I think we need to start thinking about this. So why in the world did we, did we make an applied algebra two course and leave another course? Why in the world didn't we just make an algebra two applied class? 
And why in the world aren't all of our classes applied to where when I'm learning Algebra 2, I'm probably learning some communication, some collaboration, and those kinds of things, right? So I hope we're thinking that as well. And I know we talked about this when you and I met and, and Brian and we met about this, right? So, so to me, let's, I, I like where we're going, but let's make it applied, right? And then let's figure out how to, and I know why, because then we're gonna say, well, universities didn't want the applied or whatever. Well, by gosh, then we better figure out how do we make it applied so that it counts, right? Um, and, and have those discussions as, as well. Just calling it like I see it here. Because I think this transferable skills is so, so important, right? So how do we make it, which then I think Pat does get, this is where I think we do agree, is, is then it gets to more of an applied kind of a, a, a diploma, right? Because right now, let's face it, our grad rate doesn't mean much when you think about where we matriculate to and where, our, where, where we end up, right? Um, and we can make that be whatever we want to. So then my question now, finally, to get to my question. Has success, because we hear the word success lots of times, right? And that's easy to say. Has success been defined? Because I, I have trouble with what being prepared for, and this is not, be, I guess it is being critical, but it's not being, it's, it's the question I think has to be asked. What is success? Because I think then that gets to Pat's point, that gets us where, where I think it's tough to say success without defining that. Can I pause and ask you that? What does success mean to you? Well, for me, I think this is a larger discussion. I'm not sure that you want, you, you know, I, I think for me it comes down to that student being able to do what they want to do. I, I've been saying lately, um, and this came up in a, in a teacher leader workshop I was doing last week, so I give them credit. We, we really coined this whole idea of every path matters for a student. And, and where that comes from is listening to some kids that wanted to be rock stars and, and all of a sudden, just recently, um, if, if you look up the rock band Plush, I, I'm, I'm going way beyond here, Plush, P-L-U-S-S-H, all female, all under 21. Well, their pathway mattered. Did school, did, did when they were in K-12 school, were they being helped to reach that? Or did we just say, well, you know what? The average kid doesn't get to be a rock star, so we're not going to talk about that, right? So, so that's where the incorporation of these skills into applied, can I, you know, I'm in the arts, can I be, you know, I was disappointed to see you took creativity off of here. I don't know how you measure that either, but I think it's easier than crit to measure. But, but creativity matters. And sorry I went beyond, but, but to me it's, success is can that child do what they really want to do? And do they understand what's, I, again, you all have heard me say this before too, when, when we say, hey, what do you want to be? That might be the most ludicrous question we ask kids if we haven't gone through the process of, of engage or exploring whatever, whatever those three. Yeah. If we've not gone through that, how do I even know what I want to be, right? When I, when I grow up, I'm not sure I do yet, but, but how do we know that? So success is that, but I think we need to define or have a common definition of what that is, because then that eliminates some of this bantering, right? Or, or whatever you want to call it. Well, and, and we can't ask them when they're 14. Right. And we got to make sure we got on and, on and off ramps for them when that changes, when their interests change. It's because if you'd asked me when I'm that age, I was going to farm. Yeah. And you asked me when I got out of high school, I was farming. And the economy changes and times change. and. All of a sudden, you got to find what your skill set is and what did you learn in high school to be able to go do something else. That's where we have to make certain we have flexibility with the skills we teach our kids and the timing of those skills. You know, I, I appreciate the fact that we have civic, financial, and digital literacy there. And the digital literacy will be something that starts when they're really young and they keep building upon. But that financial and that civic, if we teach kids that, when they're freshmen and we don't readdress it when they're seniors, when it's a being able to be applicable to their life, mm -hmm. that's why they don't retain the skill. Yeah, the spiral, the every, every, that's where every grade level matters in the, in the continuum. Yeah. And 
Um, and you know, thinking about this and and going back, I mean, this this is this is a draft, and uh, uh, we can adjust it, change it. We should, based on feedback from from uh, Indiana constituents and and feedback from you right here. Um, a couple other things that I, I do want to mention because it was I just want you you to know some of our thinking too. Um, one is we could probably sit here in this room and come up with 25 things that we should measure, right? And as a teacher, an educator, if we try to measure 25 things, you don't end up doing anything very well because you're measuring, and that, that's in life too, in any profession. And so the other thing I would really ask us to think about um, us all to think about is, you know, how might we be very um, strategic on what, what, are the, what are the three to five things that are really important to us in Indiana that then we can build indicators out. And, and also, we didn't mention this, the other piece was that, you know, over the past decade, um, our, our state has changed a lot, right? I mean, we've changed, let's be, let's be real here. We've changed assessments a few times. We've changed accountability models, adjusted. So the other opportunity that we, we heard from people, and I think that we have, is to create something that has a bit of a nimbleness. Because we know that the world around us is going to continue to change. We know technology is going to continue to accelerate. We know three years from now there might be a new, I looked at you when, because I was thinking pandemic, we might, we, I was thinking, looking at you, we might not, three years from now, we might have a new data point that could be powerful for school leaders, right? And, and wow, we need to capture that on a dashboard. Three years from now, we also could have other, and I don't mean to look at you when I say that, but other varying external impacts that are out of our control, but nonetheless, it's changing. So what and am so, I gonna do when I get 50 Afghan kids? all of a sudden in my school district and they're 16 years old. You know, I thought about that driving. I was in Madison last night driving back to Indianapolis and I passed mm -hmm. that, that um, exit area and I just thought about them a lot. We get I, I hope we do get Afghan. I can't oh, no. wait to get We're, Afghan students. I mean, we, wait to love them, Wait till we get 100 Louisiana kids who have to relocate like we yeah. did in 2005 and six from Katrina. Yeah. Who haven't been in this model yet. I mean, we gotta we gotta think about all those flexibilities Absolutely. as well, uh, and you know that becomes real in our, yes. our district because we get kids who are 16 years old and, yep. and have been in Sudan all their life. And and by the way, in Indiana, and your and your district's a great example. We will welcome these students with open arms, oh, yeah. and we will love them. We'll do everything possible to educate them. Um, and again, I know you're. We've talked about your EL population and and all that you do. Um, but literacy so, becomes yeah. the very first thing that they have to have because nothing else really matters. We have to teach them in English language. We have to teach mm -hmm. them how to comprehend. We have to teach them how to communicate. Mm -hmm. And yeah. at that point in time, I got like three years to do that. Mm -hmm. maybe sometimes maybe two as far as their age. Sure. We have to keep those things in mind. Yeah, I think we do. So we have not heard from, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, all of you on the phone, you're welcome to chime in too. I'm looking straight at Greg, William, and Erica, if you all have thoughts. But I, we, we really want to take the opportunity again, this is the kickoff, to really listen. And um, so I'll pause. Dr. Jenner, it's Katie Mo. I know I can't see everyone, so I don't want to step on anybody, but would it be okay if I share some thoughts? Yes, jump in. Um, just again, I know that <clears throat> We were at the very beginning, and a couple of observations as I've listened to um, others' thoughts and have reflected on the presentation. It, I really like the emphasis on transportable skills. I think it is uh, directionally very right in terms of how we can equip students in the current economy and uh, acclimate them to disruption and help them to be successful in ongoing disruption. Um, I also think we are right to be thoughtful about where we can lead in the, the K-12 system and where we need to signal and help to drive change in other complementary systems that are also working and have different accountability measures 
that influence their behavior specifically when we think about higher ed in Indiana. And I appreciate, Dr. Jenner, what you and Secretary Lovers are doing to try to continue to close any of those gaps so we can have more seamless outcomes. When we think about credentials, it's so critical that higher education can map credentials to these skill sets um, and continuing to have that um, request and pressure, I think, is important as in our space, it feels, again, directionally right to equip these students with skills so that they can be on, uh, successful on an ongoing basis and have prosperity that endures across varying pathways. Mm -hmm. um, and also when we think about accountability and holding schools holding themselves accountable and having that ability to have core lag indicators that we care about and then space for customization with other lead indicators we might measure, so critical that we're focusing on those things that as a system we name as outcomes for which we hold ourselves accountable. And so what are those? And again, I think at the end of the day, it is producing a graduate that has these enduring skills. So I, I think this work is directionally very right and appreciate the feedback that you've gotten so far. Know that that process will continue, but also I'm gonna flag that there are other systems that we can certainly signal what we seek uh, for their ongoing evolution and self-disruption as well while focusing on those that we can name and control. I really appreciate the opportunity to share those thoughts. Thank you, Katie. Appreciate your thoughts, certainly. And I think one of the things you mentioned is you know, as K-12, yes, we're very, we've, all, we've always been focused on academic mastery knowledge. We, we have a great interest in transportable skills and skill development and what you measure is what you get done, right? Actually trying to measure how this might look and making sure students are set up for pathways in an experiential way at the high school level with work-based learning, post-secondary credentials when appropriate, um, but just access to that. And I think your point about um, other systems that may de be disrupted or made uncomfortable is really, really fair. And in some ways, I think we're gonna have people leaning in to help. Uh, industry and employers, I think, uh, will be eager to, to help. Um, I, I hope higher ed um, is as well. Uh, so, Katie, very good points, and certainly stakeholders that we will be engaging with um, over the coming months as well as we think through this. Other thoughts? I'll just say that, I mean, I love four of these. I'm, I'm, I, I teach grit every day on the football field, across the, all that stuff. I think it's really important, but to pass point, I don't know how to measure it. Mm -hmm. that, that would really, really be hard yep. to do. And maybe what you teach grit to seniors, they don't really understand or apply it until they're 21, 22. I just, I, I love it, but it just worries me. And to pass point, the more we put on teachers' plates right now, this is, the last year and a half after teaching 29 years, it's like I felt like I was a first year teacher again, right? I'm trying to learn how to teach yeah. and, and um, you know, we've all been flexible um, with what we're doing, but I just, I think we have to think about those frontline educators and what they've been through. But I, I can't imagine a teacher who wouldn't support these, right? The, 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 how I hear all the time about kids graduate high school, but they don't know like how to, control their finances. I was reading yesterday on CNBC the number of Americans that aren't even close to being prepared for retirement, mm -hmm. right? And so I think these are important skills we need to teach Hoosier kids as, as they leave um, all our high schools, you know, across the state. So um, I'm on board. I just, I'm going to be with Pat. I just, I don't know how you measure it. So, yeah. Thank you. Another, I'll just throw out, well, I, I, I hate to throw out ideas until we seek feedback. Honestly, let's, let's zoom out and seek feedback. Um, but, well, I'm gonna say it anyway, gosh. I hope it doesn't lead others on, on what their thinking is. But, you know, the other option that we, we could consider is the green box and the orange, the communication and collaboration, as well as 
hard work, grit, resilience. Someone said, why don't we just call it work ethic? Um, you know, th those are within our employability skills right now. Now, I've mentioned we have 18, but in some way, those are in there. So we could, and again, we need more feedback and thought, but we could have four, and then that, that one be employability and life skills, or something to that effect, and we pick what are our top three that we're gonna measure. And again, I, I would caution us not to say we're gonna measure all 18. <laughs> no, we can't. But, Let's, let's try to do three well. Um, so again, I'm, I'm thinking out loud a bit to, to generate others' thoughts, but that, that, is, that is something that we could consider as well. Or, hey, the reality is we could, um, we could just talk about skills for another couple decades, not measure them at all and just stay focused on the data that we know, which is academic mastery and career and post-secondary um, credentials and experiences. Um, we are gonna have to do some work on, on the civic, financial, and digital literacy. I think we're well positioned in a couple areas to do that. Um, but but that, let's just, that, that's an option as well. And now it goes, it, it, Katie Moat talked about the leaning into transferable skills, so it'd be different than what she had just mentioned. But I mean, we have, we have a lot of options on the table. And again, that's where the feedback's gonna be super helpful. Byron, it looked like you maybe had a thought. No, my only thought when you said leave that out was like we've done for the however many years, that's really not worked well for us. So I'm not sure that I'm super excited about not looking at some of these new things. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Makes sense to me. And, and that's where I am. I'm ready to like roll my sleeves up because I, I think I had a elementary teacher and, and her husband, they were over for dinner on Friday night and she, 20 year teacher, and she was super <laughs> jazzed about some communication skills that she was teaching her. She had no idea, right? Like I didn't mention this at all. I, I promise I don't pull out the PowerPoint on Friday night, you know? Um, but she was so pumped to tell me about, she, she teaches third grade, about how she was teaching communication skills in her classroom. And, and she talked about how uh, she had just been to the Ron Clark Academy down in Georgia. Um, and you know everybody has different, different moments of epiphanies where you bring back to your classroom and you try some things. And what she was trying was working. And she was getting students to engage who usually did not. She's in a, in a high free reduced lunch school. Um, and she was just pumped because she could see their communication skills already. They were already you know, learning these skills even in the past um, month that she's had students in the classroom. But so, so I think some of this, I, I believe, and Greg, you mentioned this, I believe in many cases, in our, our teachers are teaching communication skills, um, for sure. Um, collaboration, depending on the content area, the classroom. Um, and so, you know, again, is there a way that we might acknowledge that, measure it? That's what we'll have to consider. So, but thank are, you for your thoughts. Are yeah. we willing to look at, you have primary, are we willing then to, are we considering that K2? Yes, sir. Can we look at three, five? as a group and then six, eight? We, because I think at times yeah. that, that doesn't get, let's face it, that, that three through five yep. and literacy? Yes, yeah. That's the proof in the pudding that where we really need to make certain kids have skills. Absolutely. And then we go six and eight, we start the exploration, the career exploration. I yep. mean, we talk about careers in the elementary and, yep. and introduce those things, but if we're really gonna start saying that we're going to make a progression three through eight uh -huh. is too wide. Yep. So your suggestion is to, to, to look. K2, three, five, six, eight, nine, 12. Noted. Thank you. And on the primary, the primary piece, I mean, that could even shift even, you know, again, into the early learning space. Yeah. Um, and, Especially and, if we make kindergarten required attendance. Yeah, the, that superintendent who I mentioned about the M and the two, um, that superintendent said in that next sentence, 
if, gosh, if, if, if we could use the, the formative data that we have to show how much our teachers are growing kids before they hit third grade and take that, that I read, I mean, it's pretty incredible what our teachers are doing and to capture that. So, I mean, that, I, I think, I, I share that example again as something that we could do um, and, and not to, and I don't think that, that, that um, I believe early learning indicators are, are really important. I do want to, again, caution us on there are a lot of things we could we could throw in as an indicator, but what indicators are reflective of the opportunities we want to see for kids? And I think we have to really keep our, our eyes focused on that as well. There could be some indicators that people think, gosh, it'd be really important if we do this. Data shows that would be important, but we don't have the data yet. Even if we don't have the data, if we have data gaps, we can still capture that and work to, to get the data um, that we need. So I don't let that be a deterrent as well. What else? Katie, yep. Katie to, your, to your point, I think this goes, you're, you're going to think I'm jumping too far ahead, but I don't want us to lose sight of this because it goes along with Greg's comment that I think are well-founded. One, one thing that you know that I've really wanted to see in this from a coolness factor as we go through the dashboard, whatever we pick, and I think it goes to Pat's point as well, I, I really do want us to see trajectories, really. I keep using words that I have trouble saying. Trajectories where every item, whatever those items are that we pick, we ought to be able to see very easily graphically or what have you. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to guess there will be parent focus groups when you get to that point to look yeah. at how cool the website is. Can I navigate it? Do I, under, do I even understand it, right? Um, sometimes I look at education websites and I have no idea what they're trying to show, right? Um, but a trajectory of are we working our way up in this? Or have we plateaued as a school or are we going down? And I think that just goes from, from my experience. You, you know, I think about when I went to manual there was no reason why that school should have ever been in the situation it was in, right? I mean, I honestly believe that. And had we really been looking at trajectories, and this is not me adding a stick, I'm not adding a stick, but I'm adding it so that schools and the community, the stakeholders can look at it, right? As to what direction you're going in places. But to Pat's point, there's gonna be where, where say, say your population changes, some things are going to change, but you ought to be able to look at the things, the, the positive areas, right? And where are we going up? We know we have these gaps that we can work, and it becomes very easy to look at, when we look at it from a system of information and transparency, as opposed to a stick system, then we need to have that to be able to see so that families can see that. Because I even think back to those days, the first year after we took that over, we were an F, the second year we were not. But the first year I remember being disappointed because it's like, gosh, we're still an F, but there are thing areas where we would not be an F if we, got, if we had some kind of a look at those pieces that we were moving up, but nobody ever looks at those, right? Because they were just looking at the, at the end result. So I, I just want to throw that back out there. It's, I, I still would love to see some specific trajectory areas where, where is the student going, or is the school going up? Is it, is it plateaued? And, what ha and I know we're talking about some areas that's hard to measure there. I get that, right? How do we show grit going up? But I think that's an important piece that I just want to throw. I know that's jumping ahead, but some things you said made me think about that. If we're really looking at this as how do we improve, I think that's an important part to improvement. Absolutely. No, and it looks at the full student's pathway, their trajectory. And yes, Erica. That's what I really like about us really looking at this dashboard. It's an opportunity to see the whole student like they've been talking about. Um, we want to be able to look beyond just the test scores. The test scores are very important, but we want to be able to see these other things that we are instilling in our students and that they're being able to use in their future. We also want to see what we didn't do well when we see those outcomes, what we can make improvements on, and I think we will get a better picture of where we need to head, but we actually have to do it first. Even though we may not like the results, the way it looks, some of the things we're struggling to measure, but I think it's gonna be good in the end. 
Thanks, Erica. <laughs> I was giving you the ah, Secretary Durham. Mm. Um, so I just have a, a thought about graduation and beyond. Yes. Um, my, my concern is um, how will we measure that? Like, what does that look like? Yep. Um, success after high school. And is it two years out, five years out, seven years out? Um, you know, I, I think of myself and I wonder, okay, well, I graduated high school in 1987, but when was I considered a success after graduating high school? Immediately, probably. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm teasing you, William. Well, it's a, it's a good, really good question. Yeah. Really yeah. good I question. What tools would be used even to measure that? Um, so what would that look like? So just, just a thought. Some of the, to that question about longitudinal post, um, in, in Dr. Keller is in the back, and I promise I'm not gonna call you up today. Um, our chief information officer who's worked for the department for years, who's been in schools, uh, he is working with MPH. MPH is, is basically for the state, like the hub that keeps all state agencies data and so some of these data points, William, we as a Department of Ed don't have, but maybe it flows through Commission for Higher Ed, Department of Workforce Development, um, FSSA, if it's on the early learning side, and that's where we would work closely with MPH as the hub to pull some of that data or, or again say, hey, we have a data question that we, is really important to be on our dashboard, and if the data doesn't exist yet, how might we better understand this? Uh, so we're working closely with them to do that, but I think it's a, it's a great question. Anyone else on the phone? It's hard to be on the phone for a meeting like this. But we're glad you're there. We're glad you're there, phone callers. Greg has a thought. I'll just have a closing thought. I just want to end on a, on a positive note. Um, we, I was thinking about hard work and resilience, and I think resilience, I think diversity. And so the great Lou Holtz, Notre Dame football coach, you say you, you show me a, a great person, I'll show you someone who's overcome adversity. And I just think about how hard our teachers and students have worked these last 18 months, right? And so I think that the teachers of model it, now the kids of model it, right? I couldn't imagine being a 16, 17 year old kid learning virtually. And so when our school opened up this fall, you know, um, there, there was all the debate about masks. Should we mask up? We didn't wear masks at first, and then we did. Kids, kids never said a word. They, they were so excited to be back. So excited to be back at school. The energy at my school, it, I mean, I get goosebumps just talking about it. I mean, that my participation rates are higher than they've ever been. Kids want to, they want to be back in school. They crave the social structure. You know, when we, we talk about the, just the, the mental damage that's been done to these kids, they need school. They need their friends, they need their teachers. Um, my grades, so last year, my first test, and this is a small data point, but my first test last year, online, open note, open book, right? They took a, a similarly same test, essay with multiple choice. I didn't give them multiple choice during the pandemic. My students this year did better without open note and open book, mm -hmm. right? And so my point is, is, is that, you know, these students are so excited to be back, right? I, I think we're going to be really amazed at what our kids are going to start doing because they want to learn. And, and great teachers push them to learn. I see it every day throughout the state of Indiana. So I'm, I know there's a lot of doom and gloom out there, but I'm also really excited about the future and where we're going as a state because I just believe in our students and, and the, <clears throat> excuse me, the teachers and administrators we have in the state. So thank you. Greg, I, to adjourn. I, I was getting ready to say, Greg, I think that was a fantastic closing Drop thought. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Don't, don't literally drop it on the floor, but thank you, Greg. And we have a motion second. to adjourn and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you.